Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our final, really, like, actually, honestly, final session of Out of the Silent Planet. Uh, we're, uh, uh, yeah, back in business. I don't even know if we're going to go the full time. We'll see. That's... If I predicted ending early, that would certainly be the death knell of any possibility that that would happen. But we'll see. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I am feeling a little bit better. I had to cancel class because I've got this, as you can hear, head cold thing going on. And uh, it's um, it was these things almost always go to my throat and I'll like lose my voice or get really painful to listen to. Yesterday was not very pleasant, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm better today, and as long as my voice holds up, I should be okay here. Uh, I got all kinds of problems, though. In addition to my voice issues, I have uh, seemed to have like sprained my foot randomly. I don't even know how I did it. So, uh, so I'm also here trying to like elevate my foot at the same time. So if you see me like chilling out over, you know, reclining this way, that's that's why. Because uh, I, anyway. All kinds of weirdnesses going on here. Um, Franny, no, I was not sick at text mood. Everything was fine at text mood. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the viruses waited for the, the, they were very kind, really, to be totally honest, right? I'm sure I got this from my son. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, has been hacking for a whole week, so... You know, things could have been bad. Things could have set in uh, during while I was in Texas, but they didn't. TexMoot was delightful. Um, we had a wonderful time at TexMoot this year talking about the apocalypse. It was really cool. Uh, I gave a little talk uh, on uh, uh, Tolkien's apocalypse. Uh, that is the apocalypse according to Tolkien. That is the very short passage that he wrote at the end of the Quentin Olderinwa, which you can find in the, which one was it? Shaping of Middle-earth, I believe. Um and uh, anyway, it's going to be uh, it's going to be fun. And yeah, no, I'm sure I'll be better, Jocelyn, by the time I get to L.A., uh, because that's um, uh, that's I'm really looking forward to heading out to L.A. in a couple weeks, uh, really week and a half, in fact. Uh, so, yeah, that's, of course, the announcement tonight uh, that I wanted to remind everybody that SoCal Moot is happening in, in Southern California. Uh, this is going to be in Hollywood at the Netflix headquarters, and we're going to be talking about adaptation. Um, and uh, it's going to be a really fun moot. Uh, uh, I'm really looking uh, really looking forward to this one. Um I'm going to be there. Um, actually, Alan Sisto of the Prancing Pony podcast is going to be there, which is really fun. I'm doing like the Prancing Pony tour right now because uh, uh, Sean Marchese was at, <laughs> was at the text moot last weekend. I get to hang out with him. I'm getting to hang out with Alan Sisto next weekend uh, for, uh, you know, not this coming weekend, but the weekend after uh, in L.A. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be really fun. Um, anyhow, yes. And, of course, um, Arthur, as you say, Mythmoot is accepting proposals, right? The call for papers is out for Mythmoot, um, so you can definitely look into that. And I would also uh, point you in the direction of tomorrow afternoon, we are hosting a special Signum Symposium, a commemoration of the life of Christopher Tolkien, an aglario for Christopher Tolkien. Uh, aglario, praise him with many, uh, uh, praise him with many praises, um, uh, as you know, aglario was said at the uh, Field of Cormallon. We're going to have a little Field of Cormallon action for Christopher Tolkien tomorrow. Um, I'm going to be hosting that, and I'm going to be joined by uh, fellow Signum faculty and other uh, Tolkien scholars, uh, um, uh, Sarah Brown uh, from the uh, the Signum Lang and Lit department is going to be there, and also John Garth, author of uh, uh, Tolkien in the Great War, is going to join us, um, and uh, also Brad Eden, uh, the uh, leader of the uh, Tolkien at Kalamazoo group, so an American scholar, British scholar, uh, two British scholars, including Sarah. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be a really fun discussion as we sort of look back and reflect on the career uh, of Christopher Tolkien. And that's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and we'll be uh, I'll be definitely broadcasting that on Twitch as well. And we'll have some uh, um, we'll have some, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, definitely time for uh, questions and discussion with the audience and everything. So uh, that will also be uh, uh, be a lot of fun. All right. Let us get back to. Oh no, John. Um, we're gonna. There's a there's a go to webinar link as well. 
uh, John, for that. Um, you can find it if you go to signumuniversity.org and scroll down just a little bit. You'll see the series of event panes of the upcoming events. You click on the event page there uh, for our symposium, and you can find all the information there. There's a direct link for the go to webinar uh, uh, as well. But as usual, I'll be monitoring both uh, the Twitch chat and the GoToWebinar chat for people who want to contribute to the discussion or ask questions of the panel. All right. Um, well, let's get back to our interrupted discussion of the text. Well, not exactly interrupted, interrupted by the fact that I ran out of time. So I suppose that's a sort of interruption. Um, but anyway, we were just looking at the cross funeral elegy right and we talked uh, uh, many things about this passage but as i recall correct me if i'm wrong but as i recall we didn't get to actually discuss the song it's the content of the song right we were looking at the uh, we were talking about this as you know his uh, relationship with their art right we were talking about i i said a couple things about um, how interesting and appropriate I thought it was that he did not try to render this into regular uh, English verse. Um, but, uh, you know, not using any verse form that's familiar to us. So he's just tried to render. So, you know, it, as, as if Ransom has just tried to give us the, uh, the essence of it, right, in prose, uh, to give us an inkling of what they were talking about rather than attempting to render the Ross poetry uh, in our language, which, which wouldn't work. Remember, his the reason that he was having a hard time connecting with it, right? Understanding it, figuring out how the poetry worked was that it's, it's, it's alien, right? It's fundamentally different. It is uh, uh, sort of attuned to a different blood than ours, as he says. Um, uh, so let's read the text of the poem again. Let it go hence. Let it go hence, dissolve and be no body. Drop it, release it, drop it gently, as a stone is loosed from fingers drooping over a still pool. Let it go down, sink, fall away. Once below the surface there are no divisions, no layers in the water yielding all the way down. All one and all unwounded is that element. Send it voyaging, it will not come again. Let it go down, the now rises from it. This is the second life, the other beginning. Open, O colored world, without weight, without shore. You are second and better. This was first and feeble. Once the worlds were hot within and brought forth life, but only the pale plants, the dark plants. We see their children when they grow today, out of the sun's light in the sad places. After, the heaven made grow another kind of worlds, the high climbers, the bright-haired forests, cheeks of flowers. First were the darker, then the brighter. First was the world's brood, then the sun's brood. Okay. So this is complicated, right? And I, I, my sense here, of course, is that Lewis is wanting to convey... Mm, this poem appears to convey sort of deliberately alien thought, right? There's a lot that's kind of hard to get here. And... I say this because, of course, not, it's in the 20th century, it was very far from unusual uh, for poets to say things that were to d deliberately to say things that are hard to understand. Right. That is far from an unusual move for a 20th century poet. But it is an unusual move for Lewis. Uh, Lewis was uh, not that kind of poet when he wrote poetry generally. Um, and, um, uh, anyway, so, um, he, I think, again, one of the things, remember that we're getting this right after Ransom has first earlier confessed the total opacity of Hross poetry to him, right? And then just in the previous paragraph, told us that now for the first time he like was able to follow it and understand it at all. Right. So, um, if it doesn't all make sense, that's good in a sense, right? Like that's, I, that seems to be sort of what, what we're going for here. Um, it's okay. 
if we don't understand all of this, but let's try to um, let's let's try to to get this as much as we can. So the the first half, right? I would I would divide this paragraph into halves, uh, and the first half is dominated by the discussion first of the downward movement and then of the upward movement, right? Let it go, hence, let it go, dissolve and be no body. Drop it, release it, drop it gently as a stone is loosed from fingers, drooping over a still pool. Let it go down, sink, fall away. What are we talking about here? We seem to be talking about the body of the now who have died, of the Hrasa who were killed, right? It is the body that is going away, that is being made no body. Now remember, the word body is used not only of like the carcass of, of creatures, right? Um, but in a more kind of uh, a scientific sense, like physics sense, right? Uh, like a body in motion. Uh, remember when uh, uh, they, what was that phrase that Oyarsa uses? Like, I shall make it a body of a different movement to you, no body, right? That's one way in which he tries to describe what he does when he unbodies something, right? When he does that thing which uh, uh, which Divine compares to the uh, um, uh, compares to like to to splitting the atom or something, right? I mean, he, he just like he just makes the uh, essentially seems to turn the the corpses into light, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, okay, so we're talking about the body dropping down. That is what I believe is the antecedent of the it from the beginning. Let it go. Let it go, hence dissolve and be no body. Right? So not again, not only meaning be no corpse, but be no physical body uh, at all. Um, notice that there is an agency there, right? Um, it's not talking about the body going down. The body is inert. It is being dropped like a stone, right? Um, loosed uh, as a stone is loosed from fingers drooping over a still pool. So this is not even the target of like active motion. It's not like a stone that's thrown or something, right? This is just a stone that is let fall from loose fingers, right? That is what the body is being compared to here, going down into a still pool. And then we get more on that pool. Once below the surface, there are no divisions, no layers in the water yielding all the way down. All one and all unwounded is that element. All one and all unwounded. The entrance, right? The entrance of the stone. The entrance of the stone into the, um, uh, into the water does not, it might appear to disrupt the surface, but it doesn't wound the water, right? The water is unwounded. All unwound, all one, and all unwounded is that element. So we get this sense of of absorption, right? Or at least of, if not absorption exactly, because it's not like a drop of water entering into the pond, right? That's not the metaphor that's being used. It's of a stone that's entering the pond. So um, when the stone falls in, it's, it is in that sense a, an alien body, right? A, 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 a foreign object in the water. And yet, it's uh, um, the water is un is unwounded. There's this sort of accommodation of the thing, right? Um, send it voyaging; it will not come again. Let it go down. The now rises from it, and that's the turn of possibly the whole paragraph, certainly of what I was describing of that downward movement and the upward movement. Let it go down. The now rises from it. This is the second life, the other beginning. Open, O oh, colored world, without weight, without shore. You are second and better. This was first and feeble. So there's a new world, a colored world. This is not, so we're not just talking about like where the body goes, right? Remember, I mean, I say that because of course, remember the body is turned into light, right? So there, you know, perhaps one could say, or one could think that um, uh, that um, you know the 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 like the colored world, right? The bright world is like the light that the body is transformed into, um, and uh, you know, and there's a kind of parallel there, but that's clearly not what we're talking. About. If anything, right? The uh, 
the fact that a flash of light is what accompanies the unbodying of the corpses, right? Um, the letting go of the bodies uh, is, um, um, if anything, that's a metaphor, right? A metaphor for the higher thing, the spiritual thing that is happening, the now rising uh, as the body sinks down into the unwounded, yielding, undivided element of the water that it's sinking into. Um, you are second and better. O oh, colored world. Notice the shift in voice, not voice, um, person here, right? Um, it transitions in open, O oh, colored world. It's been speaking in the third person. Let it go hence. I guess you could say it's technically second person in that those are imperative, right? Which is an implied you, second person audience. Um, but Sarah, then this gets to your question. What is... Um, uh, what is who's who's doing the dropping right uh who's doing the releasing um who is the to whom are these imperatives directed right um and on the one hand um you know i don't know i don't know that it necessarily need be directed very specifically? I mean, of course, Oyarsa is one simple and obvious answer, and that may be so, right? Um, but it is possible to say, you know, let it go hence, let it go hence, drop it, release it, drop it gently, as more of a, less of a directive to an individual, like, hey, buddy, let it go hence, right? Um, instead of hearing it like that, that you could hear it as more of a, a sort of a communal... Um, I, not cooperation, um, participation, right? Like, we together say, let it go hence, right? Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, John, I agree. It has more of, it feels a little bit more like worship. Um, that kind of a, a second person invocation, even a second person imperative voice statement, which isn't intended as a command, right? That's a fairly common thing in worship and prayer, right? I mean, one doesn't really mean, I think, if one says something like, um, oh, Lord, hear my prayer, that is technically imperative, which means technically you have just given a command to the Almighty when you say, oh Lord, hear our prayer, right? Uh, but that's not the tone of it. That's not, it's not, re it, that's, that's not really it, right? Again, it's a communal thing. It's a communal utterance. Um, l let it be so. It's a direct, you know, that one, of course, has a direct invocation at the beginning. This doesn't uh, have um, a direct invocation in that way, right? There's no, oh Lord, at the beginning. Oh Lord, hear our prayer is uh, the comparison I was just making. Um, however, I think it's a little complicated, right? On the one hand, if anyone is doing the dropping of the stone here, it would be Oyarsa, right? Um, Oyarsa is the one who is going to unbody the Hrasa, the dead Hrasa. Um, it's clear that Oyarsa has this sort of authority on Malakandra. But I think the question of like, wait, is Oyarsa the one dropping, you know, letting it go and dissolving it so that it be that it is no body? Or is it Meleldil who does that? I don't think that Malakandra, that, you know, Oyarsa himself would um, find that necessarily a very sensible question, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, I don't think it's necessarily one or the other in that kind of way. Carrie, yeah, a ritual supplication. That is what that sounds like to me there at the beginning. Um, uh, but anyway, then it shifts, right? Whatever is happening, and I think that that's what's happening there at the beginning, it shifts. Open, O colored world. Without weight, without shore. You are second and better, right? Not just using now the imperative voice, without 
pronouns other than the third person pronoun about it, right? About the body. Um, now it's not a, so we have the, dis, the, 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 the shift from talking about the body to talking about the soul, right? Talking about the now that rises from the body. Um, and interestingly, you could say like, well, it makes sense to not address the body because the body isn't the person. It's the soul. That's the person, right? But when we have the now rising, uh, from the body, it's not the now that's addressed. It's the world into which the now goes open. O colored world without weight, without shore. You are second and better. This was first and feeble. This was first and feeble. Um, yeah. Oh, Leanne, I really like that reading. Leanne uh, says uh, to her ear, it sounds like uh, it's telling the individual now to let the body go. That's really interesting. Let it go. Hence, let it go. Hence, dissolve and be no body. Right. That the now themselves drop release drop gently as a stone is loosed from fingers drooping over a still pool. I like that, Leanne. Though, again, um, uh, as you say with Oyarsa's leave, right? Um, to say, is it the now who does this or is it Oyarsa or is it Meleldil is, I think, st still, per still perhaps not an entirely uh, meaningful question. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting reading. I like that. Um, exactly, Leanne, right? Not, as Leanne specifies, not in a suicide -y kind of way. No, exactly. Death has already happened, right? Um, uh, exactly, exactly. Um, yes. Open, O world, without weight, without shore. You are second and better. This was first and feeble. And of course, the other thing that's very noticeable there is that not only uh, do we have we shifted uh, person right now speaking you directly to the world, um, not to anybody doing any kind of dropping or releasing, right? But to the second world into which the now rises, the tense also changed. Uh, and, and I know uh, many of you noticed that, right? Um, what was I just lost my place? Um, yeah, you are second and better. This was first and feeble. This was. This world, presumably, right? Life. Um, this is the second life, the other beginning. Open, O colored world, without weight, without shore. You are second and better. This was first and feeble. This first world. This first feeble world with weight, with shore, right? Um, there is things drop down, right? Like the stone sinking through the water to settle at the bottom, right? Um, there is this kind of, even if you don't think of it in terms of weight being a bad thing, it's, um, well, it's directional, right? If you drop a stone into a water, that's an, ev into the water, it's going to sink through the water. That's an event which has an end, right? It's, there's a horizon, at the bottom of that pond, right? It's going to sink through the water and it's going to settle down and then it's done. It has achieved its end. It has fulfilled its purpose. It's done moving, right? The colored world without weight is also without shore, right? There's no edge. There's no, um, uh, there's no boundary, right? That you come to like the stone reaches a boundary at the bottom of the pond, right? And it's, colored as you know presumably uh the first one is not or at least compared with the second one the first one is as if it were colorless right so we've got the 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 life the second life the colored world without weight without shore second and better this was first and feeble and that is of course that that sentence this that you know independent clause there this was first and feeble is especially evocative coming from People who are still alive, right? Who are still in that world, right? Speaking of that world in which they are in, in the past tense, right? Um, 
Yes. And Stephen, you're right. And thank you for reminding me of that comment that you made a while back. Um, I think that you're right. Malachandra is not bent, right? Um, and yet they do look forward to a second better world. And I think of the examples that we've seen. There is sin in Malachandra. It is not perfect. Um, it is not sinless. It is not, you know, unaltering. Um, it's, it, we can see clearly, right? There's lots and lots of evidence that there is decline in Malachandra, right? I mean, think of those, all those forests and, you know, the fossils of all those dead birds. Um, you know, this is, uh, um, things have definitely changed in Malachandra and there is this sense, you know, it's not going to last forever, right? Malachandra understood in time, right? The whole run of the life of the planet of Malachandra is like that stone drifting through the water and it's eventually going to hit the bottom, right? And that's okay. That's what's supposed to happen, right? That's what's supposed to happen. One thing I would recall here, um, I don't want to get into too big of a diversion, but the whole rock sinking down through the water thing makes me think, and it seems to me too relevant not to mention at all. Um, it's another Boethius thing. Um, it's all in Boethius. The, um, okay, I'll try to do this as briefly as possible. And, I, and, I, and it's hard because I know I've done this for many of you before, but um, Lewis was very good on this point. Uh, you can read more about this in his book, The Discarded Image, uh, about the way medieval and Renaissance people looked at the world. Um, in the modern world, our mm, the metaphorical structure that we apply to the world, when we talk about, like, when you let go of a rock and it drops down, we say it's obeying the law of gravity, right? Now, that's a metaphor. There's not a law, right? Nobody passed a law, right? Um, and it's not obeying. Like, it's not, like, the, 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 the stone is not, in fact you know, exerting civil obedience, right? As if it could rebel or something. Like, if it were a bad rock, it would, it would disobey the law of gravity. Like, no, it's not what's actually happening. But that's our metaphor, right? Our metaphor is about laws and obedience when we talk about these things. The metaphor, the way that they talked about, the way, the metaphorical structure in which they understood that same thing in the Middle Ages, and again, this comes from Boethius, is that all things have a home that they want to go to. All things, everything wants to go home. And the home of the rocks is in the sphere of earth, which is at the bottom, right? It's below the sphere of the water, which is below the sphere of air, which is below the sphere of fire. That's why fire goes up through the air. That's why bubbles rise up through the water. That's why rocks fall through the air and sink through the water because they're trying to get home, right? Um, so, I think that that's relevant here because, of course, again, that sinking, that stone sinking through the water is, it, it's eventually going to end, right? Its story is going to come to an end. But that's not a sad ending, right? That's a happy ending. It's going to get home to where it belongs, right? It will, it will fulfill it. It will run its race. It will fulfill its course, right? It will be done, Um it will be done and, and, and well done, right? Um, and uh, that is seems to be Oyars' general attitude uh, towards the history of his world, right? And, uh, uh, and, and of his people. Um, there is, this is the, you know, this is the, they are, they are, they are doing their thing. And eventually their time is going to come um, uh, to an end. Um, carry exactly. It comes to rest in a new place. Yes, absolutely. Um, so again, I see the same sort of thing here because, and then notice the now rising right out of the, you know, so the body sinking down and the now rising, um, of course we'll, we'll come back to the whole time thing and being home and, you know, coming to the end of your story, not being a bad thing. That will be very relevant when we discuss as we're uh, very soon going to, uh, discuss the translation, uh, for Weston. Um, but anyway, the now rising is also follow obeying the same law, right? Returning to its home, this colored world without weight, without shore, the second and better world, the second life, the other beginning, that is the true home of the now, 
right? This, of course, is why the Chnau of Malachandra don't fear death, right? Because this place, this world that they live in, even though Malachandra is really quite nice and everybody gets along, um, it, it, this is not their home. It is still um, the world with weight and with shore. It's still first and feeble compared to the second world. Because that second world is the true home to which the souls of the Chnau are naturally drawn, like the stone is drawn down to the sphere of earth. Right? Again, that's that, by the way, was the whole reason that Boethius was talking about um, rocks and things falling and stuff. Uh, uh, because he was saying human souls are the same thing. Right? We came from God. We want to go back to God. That's Boethius's ultimate point. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, now is where it gets tricky, at least for me. Once the worlds were hot within and brought forth life, but only the pale plants, the dark plants. We see their children when they grow today, out of the sun's light in the sad places. After, the heaven made grow another kind of worlds, the high climbers, the bright-haired forests, cheeks of flowers. First were the darker, then the brighter. First was the world's brood, then the sun's brood. I don't think I understand this. Um, as far as I can see, the Hrosa are now leaping up one more step. Uh, to, so they seem to be saying, first, think of the stone, right? Dropping down and the soul of the now rising up. And understand by the metaphor of the stone about you know, the body and the soul and how all that works. Uh, okay. And then this first world and the second world, right? So now we're not thinking of that only spatially dropping down and rising up, but thinking about that in time, the second life, the other beginning, second and better, first and feeble. Okay. Um, now it seem they seem at the end there in those last few sentences to be using the death of the now itself as a metaphor for the life of the solar system or of the universe or of something else um, that just as we have the first and feeble world that we are born in incarnate in our bodies as we are uh, and we look forward to the second life, the colored world. Um, so too, there were once worlds which only, which brought forth life, but only pale plants and dark plants um, that grow out of the sun's light in the sad places. And then after, there was another kind of worlds. My problem is I don't know what he's what they're talking about here. Like what worlds are we really talking about planets? Like is, is the, and okay. So the only division of planets, like categories of planets that we've been given from within the Malachandrian framework, I mean, not our framework, um, but from within the Malachandrian framework, the only division between planets we've gotten are inside or outside the asteroid belt, right? Mars is on the boundary, right? We've got, we've got Venus, Mercury, Earth, and Mars in the one category. And then we've got the great worlds, right? Glundondra um, uh, and Lundondra, I think. No, Lurg, Lurgondra, I think is Saturn. Anyway, whatever. Lurga, I believe, is the, if I'm remembering correctly. Whatever. The point is, that's the only division we've gotten but I don't know which is which. Uh, are our worlds the ones which have only brought forth the pale plants, the dark plants? Is that a way of talking about the life on these worlds? We know Mars is a very old world, and the life on it is very old. Um, after the heaven made grow another kind of worlds, the high climbers, that would seem to support the theory that we're talking about, like Jupiter and Saturn here. High climbers in the sense of being further away from the sun. The bright-haired forests, cheeks of flowers. 
First we're the darker, then the brighter. Our planets are dark and those are brighter. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't get it. Um, but I'm not worried about not getting it. Again, I, I kind of think that the... Uh, um, yeah, John, I, I was thinking of that too, that the inner planets are not gas giants and the, the inner planets are rocky. So that would make sense of them being the sort of the first and feeble, the uh, the dark and pale things, right? Um, and Colette, it is possible that um, we're not, th that it is thinking, so Colette is suggesting this is still thinking in time, right? Like this world uh, and next world, right? We've got the worlds which are now and the worlds which are to come so that not just in the life of the individual now, but in the life of the planet, like the, the, the planets as we see them now are the first, are the darker, right? And the brighter are yet to come. Um, so Colette, in that sense, it would be referring to the, um, to the new heavens and the new earth, essentially, right? There's going to be a new creation. There is going to be a second life, another beginning, not just for the individual now after death, but for, you know, the field of Arbol, for the uh, the solar system as a whole. Um, I think that that's very possible. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not sure I'm understanding it exactly. Um, we see their children when they grow today out of the sun's light in the sad places. I mean, that does sound, as several of you have suggested, like fungus or mushrooms or something, but can it be that specific? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Are there older planets? Are, like, or, you know, Thulchandra and Malachandra and those, are those the second round of planets? Were there older planets which didn't have life like ours? And again, it's sort of suggesting this kind of semi-cyclical, but not just repetition, this sort of repeated pattern of increasing uh, glory as we move through. I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, David, I do agree. Um, uh, David Erbach was quoting uh, Stephen in the chat saying that, uh, uh, in, wondering how the Cerrone and the Fiffle Triggy would express these sentiments. I have no doubt that the Sorns would express it somewhat more clearly and lucidly like this, but probably less powerfully, too, right? I mean, it's the Hrosa who are the great poets, right? And th therefore, they are the ones who probably, in a, in a sense, understand these things better, right? And I agree with you, Devorah, the Fiffeltrigi wouldn't talk about it at all, right? They would depict it in some way, but we might not understand the depiction, just as Ransom was a little puzzled by his self, by his portrait, remember. Um, anyway, uh, fun stuff. So see, that's why I wanted to, that's why I wanted to come back to this because I was quite sure we didn't get a chance to do that last time. Um, but now let's go on to one of my favorite parts of the book, which is the translation uh, scene. Um, when Weston is trying to defend his point of view, he is trying to explain why he is doing what he is doing. He is, this is his martyrdom speech, right? Weston does not believe he's going to escape. He believes he's going to be killed. And instead of trying to sort of grovel and get out of it in some way, remember Divine is sitting on the ground and saying things like, no, no, like, just let us go and we'll never come back. Just give us plenty sunbloods, right? He just wants a lot of gold and then he'll leave. Um, uh, Weston, of course, is not taking that line at all, right? Weston is owning what he, uh, what he believes, right? What he, um, uh, why he has done these things. Um, you're, you're right, James. It's exactly right. He's idealistic to the end. Absolutely. <clears throat> but he can't say it. His language isn't good enough to say it, right? So he, has, he asks Ransom, whose grasp of the Malachandrian language is better, or at least of the Hrasa language, to translate for him. Um, and this is wonderful. So one thing I should... Um, one piece of context I would like to give. 
this is reminiscent of something that C.S. Lewis talks about a lot in his nonfiction. Um, and he talks about it in a very different context. And that is when you're trying to explain things to people and here in the context, when he's usually talking about this, he's talking about, you know, talking to people about Christianity, like when he's giving his public lectures and things like that, the radio talks that were, um, eventually published as the book Mere Christianity and that kind of thing. Um, he did a lot of that in his later career. And one of the things that he, and he talks, he doesn't only do it, but he talks about it a lot. And that is the importance of translation. He's like, you've, when you, you've got to speak in the actual language that people use. Um, and one of the points that he makes, it's not just about being understood, right? It's not just about using, you know, using, like words from a particular jargon or vocabulary that people aren't going to follow. Um, uh, and it's not even only, it is about that, but there's more than that. He also says it's also about making sure that you are being understood because sometimes people will like uh, a particular word will mean something to your audience, very different from the way you're using that piece of vocabulary. And if you don't know that, then you're not, effectively communicating, right? You might think you are, but you're not. But more than that, he also says that this is ultimately the test of whether or not you even understand what you're saying, right? He says that the, the, the danger of using jargon, the danger of using, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a language that you are, um, the language that you're familiar with, right? That like, again, your own kind of the, 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 the fancy terminology in which you're used to stating these things. If you can't state it in plain English, that could be understood by a totally uneducated person who's totally outside of this, who doesn't already buy into a lot of the same things that you buy into, right? Who's not part of that culture that you're a normal part of, right? If you can, if you can explain it, to, to an uneducated person outside of your immediate culture, then um, then you'll know, he says, whether or not you really understand what you're talking about. Right. Um, so this was um, this was an important thing. And he often felt when he was criticizing um, a lot of the ideas that people were uh, putting forward at the time, some of the things like eugenics and vivisection and, uh, you know, the march of progress in science and all those things, which were such major issues uh, back in the 30s, 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, uh, one of the critiques that he often had was how the there was deliberate obfuscation of what they were actually saying. Right. Um, you would have people who would be arguing. Remember back to um, the the idiot boy. Right. The the uh, the the simple son of the that old woman that Ransom meets in the road back in chapter one. Right. And Weston's attitude, Weston and Divine, both their attitude towards him. Right. Um, as this sort of expendable creature and, uh, you know, in a well-governed society, as Weston says, uh, you know, he would be at the least neutered, if not, uh, uh, he, you know, he would be used for experimental purposes. He would be surrendered up for experimental usage. Um, again, it's one thing to sort of talk that way in general terms, right? Or you talk about, uh, you know, the, the liquidation of undesirable population elements, right? And Lewis was saying... Um, Instead of talk, you know, when you talk like that, you can deceive yourself, right? Um, but if you actually translate that into simple English, right? Um, if instead of saying the liquidation of undesirable population elements, you say instead killing poor people, right? Which is what you're talking about, right? Like the execution um, of poor people, um, uh, you know, of the poor or the crippled or the infirm or whatever, um, you know, then you're, you, you are sure that you're facing what you're actually talking about. Right. Um, so it's, um, it's really interesting. I, so I love the way that he contrives this, right. Um, what he produces therefore here at the end 
is this really fascinating exercise in translation where Weston in full, and, and I agree with you, Michelle, uh, Weston is in full. It is a far, far better thing I do mode, right? Um, he is pontificating and therefore he is using pontificating language. Look at the contrast, not just between in the substance, right? But as Ransom is attempting to convey the essence, the substance, what Weston's saying, what the things that Weston is saying really boil down to, right? Because Ransom's own vocabulary is still very simple, right? So he has to render it into really simple language. Um, and you, you can see, uh, so Lewis uses this as an opportunity to emphasize the differences there. To you, I may seem a vulgar robber, but I bear on my shoulders the destiny of the human race. Your tribal life with its Stone Age weapons and beehive huts, its primitive coracles and elementary social structure, has nothing to compare with our civilization, with our science, medicine, and law, our armies, our architecture, our commerce, and our transport system, which is rapidly annihilating space and time. Our right to supersede you is the right of the higher over the lower. Life, and then of course here Weston, or Ransom interrupts him and says, hang on, that's all I can do in one go. Right. So first we look at the principles, right? Um, our right to supersede you is the right of the higher over the low. We are obviously demonstrably a higher culture than yours. Right. Remember that even Ransom uh, was subject um, to uh, to these. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it ends with life. <laughs> and Arthur said, don't talk to me about life. Uh, yes. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide quote. Uh, anyway, um, even Ransom talked about things like them, their culture being on a very low cultural level. Right. So that sense of a higher and lower culture is something that is still in Ransom's mind. Now, remember what Ransom has learned, of course, is that. Um, I, appearances can be deceiving, right? If you equate highness and lowness of culture, I don't think that even now Ransom would, would, would say he doesn't think there's any such thing as a higher and a lower culture, that all cultures are sort of the same. But what I think that Ransom would very strongly say is that the ones that might look higher or that might look lower aren't necessarily lower, and the ones that look higher aren't necessarily higher. Um, yeah. And James, that's a really interesting point. James Stevens says that this talk about higher and lower is really interesting in the context of the song talking about the now going up and the body going down. Um, that is really interesting, James. Um, yeah. And Stephen, you're absolutely right. A lot, most, a lot of the things that Weston mentions are only necessary because of our bent nature. Agreed. Things like law and architecture, right? Even commerce. There's commerce in um, Malacandra in the sense that, you know, the, the Krasa are good at growing things, so they seem to grow the food, which is then eaten by everyone, by the Sorens and Fifiltrigi as well. Um, but, um, but they don't need commerce in the, you know, in the, in the terrestrial sense. Um, yeah, good. Eric medicine too. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. And Jennifer Ewing, you're exactly right that there is a great deal, you know, all of the, the sort of bent assumptions of Weston, not only just in his in the essence of his statement, right, that are that they have a right. We have a right to supersede you. Right. Um, but as Jennifer points out, um, a lot of his language, like rapidly annihilating space and time. Right. The idea that our transport system is annihilating time or space. Right. That's a, a, a remarkable way of thinking about our transport system about what transport does, right? It kills time, right? Wipes it out and space. Really? Um, also look at the, the level of metaphor being employed 
in statements like, I bear on my shoulders the destiny of the human race, right? Think of how many layers of metaphor are involved there. The human race, even that is in a sense a little like a an interesting generalization, right? The destiny of the human race, what is that exactly? And in what sense do you bear it on your shoulders? Um, anyway, here's Ransom's translation. Among us, Oyarsa, there is a kind of Hnau who will take other Hnau's food and, and things when they are not looking. He says that he is not an ordinary one of that kind. <laughs> That's my favorite sentence, I think, in the entire translation uh, there. He is not an ordinary one of that kind. Of course, he's translating, to you I may seem a vulgar robber, right? And so first he's got to explain what a robber is, right? So you see how the lack of understanding starts from the beginning, right? To you I'm a, I may seem a vulgar robber. And he, Weston, doesn't even understand that they don't even have the concept of robber. They don't even know what that even means, right? Um, that's, uh, so anyway, uh, but that's it. He is not an ordinary one of that kind, right? No, no, he is an extraordinary one of that kind. He says, what he does now will make very different things happen to those of our people who are not yet born. He says that among you, now, first of all, what do you notice right away about Ransom's translation. He says that what he does now will make very different things happen to those of our people who are not yet born. Notice how vague that is? What, what, what exactly is he doing now? What different things are going to happen <clears throat> to those of our people who are not yet born? <coughs> well, you don't know. Right? <clears throat> but again, the um, the point is that he's not being more vague than Weston was. He's just, the vagueness is more obvious, right? He's, again, he's here translating, I bear on my shoulders the destiny of the human race. Well, what on earth does that mean? What is their destiny, right? In what sense is he moving that destiny forward? Or is he bearing that destiny on his shoulders? He certainly has not said Right. Um, and again, this is one of the things this is one of the cautions that Lewis uh, frequently gives about this kind of language is that it sounds like you are saying something like you're really saying something significant. But in fact, <clears throat> if you try to translate it into very plain speech, you find that you have not, in fact, conveyed anything. Right. You've only made very impressive sounding innuendos, right? Um, <clears throat> Colette, how wonderful. You are right. Colette says, does this translation help us to, to define Lewis's use of vulgar? Uh, as I was wondering about in the first session, it's almost like ordinary, right? He's not an ordinary one of that kind. Interesting. He does associate ransom does here, right, seem to associate the idea of vulgar robber with an ordinary one of that kind. So vulgar, one of the senses or one of the elements of the word vulgar being kind of run of the mill, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, okay. <clears throat> Keep going. He says that among you, now of one kindred all live together. And the Hrossa have spears like those we used a very long time ago, and your huts are small and round, and your boats small and light like our old ones, and you have one ruler. He says it is different with us. He says we know much. There is a thing happens in our world when the body of a living creature feels pains and becomes weak. And he says we sometimes know how to stop it. <laughs> I love that synopsis of the word medicine, right? Uh, uh, and again, how how brutally honest that is, right? That in the end, what Weston is bragging about is that we can sometimes stop a body dying when it becomes weak and feels pain. Like we can sometimes stop pain in a body, uh, sometimes, but not always, right? That's what ultimately he's bragging about. He says we sometimes know how to stop it. He says we have many bent people. And we kill them, 
or shut them in huts, and that we have people for settling quarrels between the Bent Hnau about their huts and mates and things. He says we have many ways for the Hnau of one land to kill those of another, and some are trained to do it. He says we build very big and strong huts of stones and other things, like the Fifiltrigi. He says we exchange many things among ourselves and can carry heavy weights very quickly, a long way. Because of all this, he says it would not be the act of a Bintchnau if our people killed all your people. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, yes. Um, uh, Yes, Stephen, I agree with you. I was thinking that when I was listening to it this last time. Stephen says, I get the feeling that whether he can understand the words or not, Weston isn't actually listening to Ransom's translation. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, notice the different... Th so notice how this translation, again, by, by taking the things that Weston is saying in his high register and translating them into simple speech. Um, Ransom is demonstrating not just the absurdity, but the wickedness of what Weston actually means. So what are the, what are the principles that we can see here? One, clearly, these things that he's bragging about are not all things to be bragged about, as we were already looking at, right? Like armies, law, right? Um, because we have many bent people and we kill them or shut them in huts, right? because we have a criminal justice system, therefore, it would not be the act of a bent now if we committed genocide against you, right? It, would be, it wouldn't be evil for us to commit genocide. Really? Um, because we have many ways for the now of one land to kill those of another and some are trained to do it. Really? That's why we have the right to commit genocide? genocide. There are some other things which just illustrate uh, point somewhat painfully to Weston's own ignorance about Malacandra and the assumptions that he is still making about the Malacandrian society. Um, he says we build very big and strong huts of stones and other things, like the Fiffle Triggy, right? Yeah, like He's not even right about the fact that our all of our technology is necessarily way beyond the technology of uh, Malacandra, right? Again, even though the appearances are different, right? Although the appearances suggest that their culture is technologically lower, the fact that you know Augre happens to have a you know an oxygen tank suggests that it's not actually technologically very far below. And as Oyarsa is going to say later on in this conversation, um, his people could certainly have built spaceships. Um, he just didn't let them. He didn't want them to. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Colette, I agree with you. I mean, is there a slant to, uh, to Ransom's translation? Well, yes, of course, the exercise has a point, clearly. Um, and yet, I agree with you. I don't think he is merely and simply skewing Weston's words, right? Um, these sentences, again, they come off sounding really funny, um, but that is, in fact, what Weston was saying, right? This does seem to me an accurate translation. He is saying, because our society has accomplished all of these things, Therefore, and then what were his exact words? Our right to supersede you is the right of the higher over the lower. We have a right to supersede you as a society. Notice he doesn't say, if our people killed all your people, right? But that's what he means, in fact, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's keep going. Life is greater than any system of morality. Her claims are absolute. It is not by tribal taboos and copybook maxims that she has pursued her relentless march from amoeba to man and from man to civilization. Now, it is not easy to try to explain what Weston means by this. It is clear that he believes he believes in some kind of evolutionary thrust 
right? He believes in progress. Life is moving forward. Um, just as our, you know, ancestors, ancestors crawled out of the sea, so we are now leaping forth onto another planet, and it is just as, that is, you know, that step is just as inexorable, right, as the previous one. We are part of that relentless march from the amoeba to man and from man to civilization and then, our, you know, our current civilization onto our future civilization, presumably, right? Um, and all of this is being personified, right? Life is being personified, right? The cl absolute claims of life, that we are merely being obedient to something higher, right? Or rather, we are merely expressing something greater than ourselves. Notice the kind of implicit, though unstated, deflection of responsibility there, right? We, it's not like we're making a choice here. This is just how things work, right? It is not by tribal taboos and copybook maxims. Tribal taboos and copybook maxims. What does that mean? Literally, what does that mean? It seems to me that he is referring to traditional morality there. Traditional morality, like that, that, that teaching which says it's wrong to commit genocide, right? That is merely a remnant, right? That belief that there is this kind of, that there is this objective external morality, right? Is just the remnant of tribal taboos, which have been perpetuated through copybook maxims, right? Maxims, slogans that you've literally copied out of books as a kid in Sunday school or in grammar school or something like that, right? Um, yeah, Jennifer Ewing, thou shalt not kill would be a good example there. Yes. Um, anyway, Ransom's translation. He says, began Ransom, that living creatures are stronger than the question of whether an act is bent or good. No, that cannot be right. He says it is better to be alive and bent than to be dead. No. He says, he says, I cannot say what he says, O Yarsa, in your language. But he goes on to say that the only good thing is that there should be very many creatures alive. He says there were many other animals before the first men, and that the later ones were better than the earlier ones. But he says the animals were not born because of what is said to the young about bent and good action by their elders. He says these animals did not feel any pity. Okay. All true, right? Now, Ransom's translation is really disjointed here. But again, it's disjointed because Weston's speech is moving further and further away from any kind of concrete reality, right? He is speaking extremely indirectly about what he means, right? And what he means is we are a more advanced society than yours, and therefore, survival of the fittest dude, we have the right to supersede you. We have the right to kill you and take your planet for our own. That is the bald prose of what he is talking about here, right? But he's speaking in these very poetical terms. Um, there were many other animals before the first men. So he's talking about the amoebas, right? And the later ones were better than the earlier ones. But the animals were not born because of what is said to the young about bent and good action by their elders. He's trying to render, it is not by tribal taboos and copybook maxims that she has pursued her relentless march, right? So Weston is saying the relentless march of progress has, is independent of tribal taboos and about you know, traditional morality, right? Has nothing to do with the march of life from amoeba to man and man to civilization. And when Ransom faithfully translates that idea, the animals were not born because of what is said to the young about bent and good action by their elders. That's pretty much what he said, but it demonstrates how irrelevant <laughs> that is, right? That, well, of course they weren't born because of that, right? Um, and these animals did not feel any pity. And that, I guess, is supposed to be a good thing. 
Um, <laughs> Devora says, I am a sign language interpreter, and I can confirm that it's impossible to interpret for someone who doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, at least Devora, the the I mean, I'm not saying the vocabulary in sign language and 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 English are the same, but at least they're based on the same kind of terrestrial experience, right? Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, good, Stephen. Exactly the way in which Weston talks about life in the abstract, the, the abstractness, the increasing abstractness of Weston's language, right? Um, uh, D there, there is the irony, right, between the increasing abstractness of his language and the fact that he doesn't seem to care about any life but man's or what man will become or even individual men, right? Um, he's, he's completely, he's dealing in these absolutes and abstracts which seem to have lost connection with the concrete world. And that is one of the things that the translation really demonstrates. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. David Erbach says Weston thinks that he has faced reality because he is fine with acknowledging that his deals, his ideals contradict conventional morality. Right. So in saying that, in saying that he is, ready fearlessly to disregard tribal taboos and copybook maxims, right? That he is being, that he is facing reality, honestly, right? Um, but David goes on to add that he hasn't faced the sheer illogic uh, of his ideas. Um, yeah, yeah. David Atlee says it's conspicuous that Ransom doesn't say something like the animals did not become better because of what is said to the young about bent and good action by their elders, um, which seems to be what Weston really meant. Yes, I agree. But that's exactly one of the points of the translation, right? Is that um, the cause and effect relationship, which Weston seems to be referring to in the phrase, it is not by, right? Um, is one that is completely unclear, like exactly what is the cause and effect relationship that he is implying, Right. In what sense does how does he mean that tribal taboos and copybook maxims in what way have those been disconnected from the relentless march of life? Right. Um, that is left sort of in the air. Right. And um, Ransom's. He says the animals were not born because of, and he is David kind of building on right. The, the later ones were better than the earlier ones. So he's, he's, he's kind of getting that, but the animals were not born. That is the better animals were not born because of what is said to the young. I mean, I do think he's still laying out the cause and effect much more clearly than Weston was. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Sarah Grant is saying, is this the sort of thing Lewis was referring to when he talks about the life force? Yeah, this is the cat. This is the general category of things. Yes, exactly. Um, good. Nancy, you're right that Ransom hasn't even attempted to, he has not attempted to translate the concept of civilization. Um, but I agree it's hard to say exactly what that means from amoeba to man and from man to civilization as a, as an, you know, as a, like a, you know, a progression. It's a, it's a very unclear progression, right? We're talking about two different like axes of progression there. Right. Anyway, let's keep going. She has ruthlessly broken down. She being life. Of course, remember ransom has to stop him to say, excuse me, who is she again? Right. She has ruthlessly broken down all obstacles and liquidated all failures. And today, in her highest form, civilized man, and in me as his representative, she presses forward to that interplanetary leap, which will perhaps place her forever beyond the reach of death. Life has broken down obstacles and liquidated all failures. Again, notice the amazing 
um, diffusion of responsibility here, right? All failures have been liquidated by life, right, as we move forward. Um, and civilized humans are the highest form of life, baldly stated without support, evidence, right, uh, justification for that statement in any way, right? Uh, and now life will be placed forever beyond the reach of death if they, as humanity, can perpetuate themselves indefinitely by achieving the interplanetary leap. He says, resumed Ransom, that these animals learn to do many difficult things, except those who could not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> These animals learn to do many difficult things, except those who could not. And those ones died, and the other animals did not pity them. <laughs> what a great sentence that is. I mean, that's what liquidated all failures means, right? Some animals could not do the difficult things, and they died, and they were unpitied by those who survived, right? And he says the best animal now is the kind of man who makes the big huts and carries the heavy weights and does all the other things I told you about. And he is one of these, and he says that if the others all knew what he was doing, they would be pleased. He says that if he could kill you all and bring our people to live in Malacandra, then they might be able to go on living here after something had gone wrong with our world. And then, if something went wrong with Malacandra, they might go and kill all the Hnau in another world, and then another, and so they would never die out. Um, <laughs> oh man, that first sentence is such a classic. Um, Notice that what he's pointing out here in is sort of underlying Weston's rhetoric is not necessarily illogic, right? But Weston speaks as if life were a unified thing, right? Um, as if the obstacles that have been broken down and the failures that have been liquidated were something else, right? Something that life understood in this abstract way has taken action against, breaking down and liquidating being the actions that she's taken, right? Um, as if they were other than her, right? And so now civilized man embodies that um, principle of life, right? Um and the thing that Ransom's translation emphasizes, especially in that wonderful first sentence, we're not talking about life versus some other failure or obstacle. We're talking about there were some creatures who lived and some creatures who died, right? And the, the ones who died, the ones who lived didn't pity them. And the ones who have lived now can do all these things. And because they have survived so far and they in some sense, but notice he doesn't even talk like that because even, even I in saying they there am starting to generalize in a Weston like fashion, right? There's no such thing as civilized man has survived, right? There are particular people who happen to be alive now who have not died yet. Right. Um, that's the brutal truth of the matter. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And John, yes, exactly. That he Ransom's description makes the spread, you know, where Weston is talking about life being, you know, placing herself forever beyond the reach of death. Uh, Ransom's description makes humanity sound like a plague. Right. Sound like a virus. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm minded of that famous speech from Agent Smith in the uh, in the Matrix. Right. About humanity as viruses. Um, yeah. Let's keep going. 
It is in her right, said Weston, the right, or, if you will, the might of life herself, that I am prepared without flinching to plant the flag of man on the soil of Malacandra, to march on, step by step, superseding where necessary the lower forms of life that we find, claiming planet after planet, system after system, till our posterity, whatever strange form and yet unguessed mentality they have assumed, dwell in the universe wherever the universe is habitable. Again, notice the, the euphemism, right, superseding. That's the second time he's used that verb when what he means is genocide, right? Instead of talking about slaughtering all the members of another race so that their race can take their land and live in it, right? He talks about superseding the lower forms of life, right? He says, talks about planting the flag, talking about claiming, right? Um. Yeah. <laughs> Coet says, man, Weston takes no pains to make his speech easy to translate. Exactly. Yes. The metaphor after metaphor, Coet, is one of the things that's that's really important here. Right. Because. There are a couple ways in which you can be metaphorical. One is to use metaphor in order to make your meaning more readily understandable. Right. To help your hearers grasp what you're getting at. And then there can be metaphors that you're just hiding behind, right? When instead of saying what you really mean, you're using a metaphor, not only euphemistically, but more than euphemistically, right? Um, it would be euphemism just to say that, to, to talk about liquidation, right? Um, you know, when humanity arrives in Malacandra, we may have to, you know, liquidate any, you know, or we will have to overcome any resistance. That's a euphemism, right? <clears throat> but to say that um, man shall supersede the lower forms of life, that's beyond euphemism. I mean, it is euphemism, but it's much more than euphemism, right? To the point where it is actually appearing to avoid. Like, it is not at all clear. I, I'm not saying that I believe that Weston would flinch, that the idea of genocide would be repugnant to him when it came to it. Like, I'm not saying that Weston wouldn't actually follow through. But what I am saying is that he's not even facing that idea himself. He's, he's concealing, in a sense, the bald truth of what he's saying from himself, even in using these kinds of metaphors. And I think we have some evidence earlier on. Remember Divine's comment about and when he asked Weston if Weston wasn't losing his own nerve, was he? Right? Weston does seem to have some hesitations about genocide. Right? Um, Divine doesn't care. But Weston has, does seem to have some possible qualms, just as he had qualms about taking ransom, about abrogating ransom's rights, because ransom was at least a human Unlike, you know, the the idiot boy from next door. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Kit says that uh, 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 Weston is not really talking to anyone but himself. Yes, yes, that's that's really kind of true. Um, yeah, okay. He says, translated Ransom, that because of this, it would not be a bent action or else he says it would be a possible action for him to kill you all and bring us here. He says he would feel no pity. He is saying again that perhaps they would be able to keep moving from one world to another, and wherever they came, they would kill everyone. I think he is now talking about worlds that go around other suns. He wants the creatures born from us to be in as many places as they can. He says he does not know what kind of creatures they will be. And you're right, David. We see how he is continually elaborating the same ideas, saying the same thing again and again in like increasingly grandiose terms, right? Um, and the translation makes it clear how repetitive that he is saying again, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, Yeah, Carrie, that's interesting. Carrie points out that Weston is also, in a sense, hoping to escape life, the life that relentlessly, uh, that moves relentlessly over those who fail. 
Yeah, Carrie, that does seem to be, again, one of the ways in which he's not really examined the implications of his own rhetoric, right? If life is all about overcoming the obstacles and liquidating the failures, right? Um, why should we think that life is the champion of civilized man, right? Will not life ruthlessly move on and move past us, right? And liquidate us like every other failure as we too drop by the wayside? I mean, that's... Um, might not, um, and, and even in talking about life itself in this sense, right? Life in this general sense, um, he's, the idea, like the fact that he's talking about this only in regard to humanity is the more absurd. It's one thing for him to be like, whatever, I don't accept you guys as an equal rational species, right? We are better. We are the, our right to supersede you is the right of the higher over the lower, right? I do not admit that you are on our level intellectually, rationally, right? So he certainly does not believe in the equality of the now, right? That's very plain. And yet his choice of personification of life, not man, I mean, he does personify man as well, but but the personification of life. In what sense, when the species of one planet make the interplanetary leap and slaughter all of the people on another planet, where there was whatever else you might think about it, higher, or lower, or whatever, it was certainly life that was there, wasn't it? Right? So how is this a net gain for life? Exactly. Right. He doesn't, uh, again, his, his, um, the groundlessness of his assumption that killing everybody else would be okay really, really breaks down, you know, the more you think about it and the more you contrast his highly metaphorical language with the sort of plain speaking there. Um, see, Leanne, he might be thinking that we will conquer life, but that wasn't his metaphor before. It was life herself who is going to be freed from death, right? Um, yes, uh, she presses forward, which will perhaps place her forever beyond the reach of death, right? So it's, it's serving life itself, I guess, somehow. But again, how you can convince yourself that slaughtering every other form of life is a net increase of life is a little hard to understand. Um, yeah, you're right, Stephen. As a eulogy for Hyoi, this is definitely not very effective, is it? Um, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Weston tried to use eulogy. It was not very effective. Um Yes, yes. Um, and Leanne, I, I do agree with you. He is fooling himself there. He's on the side of life so long as it aligns with his goals. I agree with you. He is not ready to be... Um, he is not ready to be one of the casualties, one of the obstacles, one of the failures, right? Um, and his assertion that humanity, that civilized humanity, is certainly not that is very weak, right? I mean, there's almost nothing he has to support that idea. Um, yeah, Nancy, I agree. Life translates to the particular living beings that Weston finds valuable. I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's so many different levels of... Um, you have to go down so many different levels to get to like what Weston is actually saying there. Um, let's keep going. I may fall, said Weston, but while I live, I will not, with such a key in my hand, consent to close the gates of the future on my race. What lies in that future, beyond our present ken, passes imagination to conceive. It is enough for me that there is a beyond. He is saying, Ransom translated, that he will not stop trying to do all this unless you kill him. <laughs> Another wonderful translation. And he says that though he doesn't know what will happen to the creatures sprung from us, he wants it to happen very much. <laughs> That's exactly right. 
He doesn't know what will happen. It, it, you know, what lies in that future passes imagination to conceive. And so therefore, why are you so convinced that it's a good thing? Why do you believe that it's worth any sacrifice in the present tense to achieve? Why do you believe that that gives you the right to abrogate the rights of another person like Ransom, right? I mean, you know, he when that speech he gives to Ransom back in the spaceship, right? Surely you cannot be so, you know, shallow as to believe that, you know, that your own rights are greater than the rights of humanity, right? But, like, on what basis does he believe? Um, on what basis does he believe that... Um, that future is going to be a good future, a desirable future. He himself is confessing, quite honestly, that he has no idea what's going to come, what shape humans will be in, both in their physical and in their mental being. Right? He knows that the creatures that spring from us millions of years from now might look completely different. Um, and look in every way, not just their physical bodies, but their mental persons as well, right? their minds as well. And maybe it'll be good and maybe it won't be good, right? But he hasn't seemed to even thought of that. Um, he doesn't know what will happen to the creatures sprung from us. But he wants it to happen very much. And that doesn't make any sense at all, really. Right? But that is exactly what he's saying. Um, he... I love the cutting through of all of that. While I live, I will not with such a... I may fall, but while I live, uh, I will not consent to close the gates of the future on my race. Um, he will not stop trying to do all this unless you kill him, is what that means. Um, yes, yes. In which case, Stephen, as you say, he will be one of life's failures who will have been liquidated. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Stephen, that's a wonderful point. Stephen points out that the Hrasa appear to put their hope in a beyond that is a world beyond this world. Uh, whereas Weston also places his hope in a beyond, but that that beyond is firmly in this world. Yeah, yeah. There is no second beginning, right? There is no colored world. Um, although you can see in a sense that this beyond that Weston believes in um, and is committed to with his life. This is no insignificant thing. He really believes he's about to die. Weston does. In many ways, this is a very admirable speech by Weston, and certainly very much more admirable than Divine at this point. Um, <laughs> uh, James adds, and no one will pity him. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, I was saying the parallel between Weston's faith Right, Weston's faith in this beyond, his unquestioning faith in this beyond, is extremely parallel, and I do not, I do not think accidentally parallel. Right, um, Weston would clearly reject as tribal taboo and copybook maxim any teaching of traditional religion, any belief in a god, or any um, uh, you know belief in objective morality or anything like that. Right, and yet. The things that are the fundamental tenets of his own faith, right? What he believes is the most important thing, this sort of manifest destiny of the human race, um, is in fact closely parallel to it. It's conceived differently. It is, Stephen, as you say, a beyond within this world rather than a beyond um, in another world. But that's really the only difference. And Jennifer, yes, it's unclear exactly what his faith is in. Ultimately, his faith is, based on his words, is in an abstraction, right? Life or humanity, perhaps. His race, in a sense. Um, now, of course, you, there's also, I think, in, in him talking about the future of my, uh, uh, of my race, right? I think there's an implicit... Um, there has been already. Remember that Weston has just been employing the most traditional and orthodox tactics of how to deal with natives, right? In a very colonial context, right? Um, he is doing exactly what white explorers are supposed to do when they meet the funny, primitive, colored people in another continent, 
right? That's exactly what Weston is doing. I mean, that the parallel um, between Weston, it's not even a parallel, right? Weston is exactly enacting um, what he has learned. Um, a, 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 again, it's not, this is, it's, it's, not, it's not a subtle thing, right? Weston himself is consciously doing this. And so having just been reminded of how one race has treated another, other races within the world, right? Within the context of humanity. Um, of course, that really calls into question yet another of Weston's abstractions, right? My race. Right now he's talking about man versus the Malachandrians, right? But it's hardly true that man, by Weston's own evidence, right, of these uh, orthodox imperialist tactics, betray the fact that his view of his race is even more narrow than that. Um, yeah, yeah. Stephen, I agree. I agree. I think this is a, a, one of the really interesting things about this passage is that although Ransom's translation is delightful and I always laugh when I hear it. Um, and there are, of course, ways, you know, it, it does such a wonderful and effective job of just bursting the bubble of all of Weston's highfalutin rhetoric. I agree with you that although Weston is detestable, it's hard not to respect and even admire his, the strength of his faith in his own worldview, right? His conviction in his principles. Um, <clears throat> he is not just you know, like divine seeking his own wealth, right? His own betterment. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly, Devora. His race is civilized man, which presumably means white folks, even though he's not explicitly saying that. But again, the point is that although Weston hasn't said anything like that exactly, um, I, I, again, it, it just calls into question his vocabulary, right? What he means, even when he says something like my race, which seems like one of the least metaphorical things that he's saying in these speeches. And yet even that isn't obvious. Okay. All right. Here's Oyaris's conclusion, having heard the speech. I see now how the Lord of the silent world has bent you. There are laws that all now know of pity and straight dealing and shame and the like. And one of these is the love of kindred. He has taught you to break all of them except this one, which is not one of the greatest laws. This one he has bent till it becomes folly and has set it up thus bent to be a little blind Oyarsa in your brain. And now you can do nothing but obey it. Though if we ask you why it is a law, you can give no other reason for it than for the other and greater laws which it drives you to disobey. Do you know why he has done this? Me think no such person. Me wise, new man. No believe all that old talk. Right? Oh no, I don't have any of this religious superstition. I don't have blind faith in these tribal deities and things. No way, man. I will tell you. He has left you this one because a bent man, a bent now, can do more evil than a broken one. He has only bent you, but this thin one who sits on the ground he has broken. For he has left nothing, for he has left him nothing but greed. He is now only a talking animal, and in my world, he could do no more evil than an animal. But if he were mine, I would unmake his body, for the now in it is already dead. But if you were mine, I would try to cure you. Notice that Oyarsa also, um, Oyarsa also admires Weston, right? Acknowledges that there is still there is still something there in Weston, right? He is not completely depraved. By the way, that's bent is basically a translation of the word depraved uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in one way of understanding it. Um, anyway, um, and yes, Stephen Oyarsa does feel pity. Absolutely. Um, he pities Weston for what has been done to him. Notice that's his response. I see how the Lord of the silent world has bent you. You have been bent. Weston is a victim, is a product of this bent culture that has been fostered on Thulkandra. 
Yeah, Karita, you're right. Admires might be going too far. Um, he sees that he's sick and not completely dead, morally speaking. I know that's fairly low admiration, perhaps. But I merely mean, by, ad by admires, I mean he sees that there is good in him. There is something that is salvageable in Weston. Right, Weston is doing what he. I remember that's uh, Oyarsa's very first response when he, after he hears the and you know, listening to Ransom's translation, I, I, you know, I I always almost half expect Oyarsa to respond by saying, "This creature is appalling. Like, let us destroy him." Right, and if he said that, it wouldn't be, you know, it would be hard to blame him, um, given. Uh, Weston's frank genocidal intentions, right? Um, Weston is very bent indeed, as his words show, or the truth behind his words show. Um, but that's not Oyarsa's response. Oyarsa's immediate response is, I see that he's not as bad as I thought he was, right? Um, he's, there is still, he at least is doing what he's doing for the sake of others, and not just himself. Right. He believes in something higher than himself. That's good. That's a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Arthur, he's descending into Tarzan talk because he's speaking in Malachandrian here. He doesn't. Um, he, this is his. Uh, yeah, his vocabulary is very, very poor. Um, so this is him trying to speak directly. Um, yeah, exactly, Coet. Feeling love for humanity isn't inherently bad, but Weston has taken a good thing and making it made it an ultimate thing. Um, yes, exactly, exactly. And Jennifer, I agree. Jennifer Pope says he's salvageable, but also more dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. Both true. Both true. No, divine could do no harm than an animal, right? I mean, he's, he's, um, in Malachandria, he would be almost harmless. Um, but also unsalvageable, Oyarsa thinks. Okay. Um, I'm skipping over most of the homeward trip. Uh, uh, of course there's the, Reimmersion in the uh, into space, the reassertion of um, that insight that he had when he descended into the Martian atmosphere that uh, uh, he was, you know, that the worlds are not spots of life in the midst of vacuous, empty darkness, but the other way around. Um, even his desire that, like, to be unbodied with the ship while in the heavens. Um, was a consummation devoutly to be wished, right? That uh, um, he hoped that if he died, he believed he was going to die and he hoped that it would be that way. Um, we can begin to see how this experience, um, uh, how this experience is uh, beginning to work in Ransom, a uh, an attitude towards death, which is more, like a Malachandrian attitude. Anyway, then we get to the epilogue. At this point, if I were guided by purely literary considerations, my story would end. But it is time to remove the mask and to acquaint the reader with the real and practical purpose for which this book has been written. At the same time, he will learn how the writing of it became possible at all. Dr. Ransom, and at this stage it will become obvious that this is not his real name, soon abandoned the idea of his Malachandrian dictionary, and indeed all idea of communicating his story to the world. He was ill for several months, and when he recovered he found himself in considerable doubt as to whether what he remembered had really occurred. It looked very like a delusion produced by his illness, and most of his apparent adventures could, he saw, be explained psychoanalytically. Psychoanalytically. He did that's not an easy word to pronounce. He did not lean very heavily on this fact himself, for he had long since observed that a good many real things in the fauna and flora of our own world could be accounted for in the same way, if you started with the assumption that they were illusions. But he felt that if he himself half doubted his own story, the rest of the world would disbelieve it completely. He decided to hold his tongue, 
and there the matter would have rested, but for a very curious coincidence. And that, of course, was Lewis, the author's correspondence with Dr. Ransom on philological points, asking him about the word oyarsis that appears in Bernardus Silvestris. Um, and uh, um, anyway, um, then his... Uh, and Ransom telling him all the truth about Oyarsa and about Malacandra. Um, Stephen says, Dr. Ransom, and at this stage it will be obvious that is not his real name. Tolkien visited Mars. Confirmed. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Nancy says, I have a kind of bad emotional reaction to ending a novel with the protestation that it's all true. Don't know why. I'm fine starting a novel that way. I agree, Nancy, that it is interesting to assert the frame at the end. It's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this passage. Um, I, I was almost tempted just to skip the epilogue, but I'm like, nah, we need to talk about the epilogue. Um, because he does really change the move this way, right? The whole sort of sense of the story. Um, what's the effect? What is the effect of um, A, asserting that this is a true story and, but, and B, doing so after the fact, doing this in an epilogue rather than at the beginning. What do you think? What does he accomplish by doing this? What, how does it change the story for us to get this and to get it at the end instead of the beginning? For me, it seems to make a push towards applicability, right? Um, on the one hand, one thing I'll say about this epilogue, it doesn't sound terribly convincing, right? That is, when we put down this epilogue, are any of us in any real doubt that Lewis, that C.S. Lewis, the author, was not, in fact, claiming that it really happened? Right? It's not real. The frame itself is a fiction. And I think fairly transparently a fiction? There does not seem to me to be a very striking attempt by Lewis to make this super believable. Um... Nancy says, yeah, I think I agree that that's part of what's weird. Exactly. Yeah. So there are two basic effects, I would say, of this move in the epilogue. One is, and Christy, that's a great way to say it. Christy Simonson says, it challenges you to consider the real world implications of the philosophy discussed. Yes. Weston, Weston's ideals what Weston stands for and the, you know, and therefore the sort of Westonian implications of interstellar travel, right? These issues are real. These are really applicable questions. And in a sense, to challenge us to do this same act of translation, to perform this same act of translation on the speech of people that we hear in the real world, right? To say, there is this real evil afoot. There really are people who would be willing to do this. This is the direction that many of, that many people, you know, that many scientists, politicians are pushing, right? And of course, in this sense, uh, you know, thinking of genocide, Lewis is being slightly prophetic here, right? Remember, this is all pre-Nazi stuff that he's, uh, when he's writing this. Um, so, you know, uh, he's, he's, um, yeah, because it was uh, published in, it was 1938, Stephen, but it was written 
several years before that. I mean, the toss-up between Lewis and Tolkien about space and time travel was early 30s. Um, uh, and from my recollections of the letters, this book sat around for a little bit before it was finally accepted and published. Um, so it's not even that it was just written immediately before 1938. Uh, um, I believe if it were very early 30s, it would, in fact, okay, right around the same time. Nazis came to power 31 or 32. Right. So it's certainly not dependent. Of, you know, it's not like he's just pointing to the Nazis here. Um, um, yeah. Anyway, and certainly in 1931 and 32, very few people were predicting the concentration camps, right? Even those who were listening to and praising the Nazis. Um, yeah, yeah. And Brian, I agree that the implications were even more important in a world where space travel hadn't actually yet happened and where encounters with other species would have seemed very possible in the short term. Yes, agreed, agreed. Um, one of the, so one of the simple effects of the frame is that it, it reminds us this is current events, right? Um, it doesn't matter whether or not, like, the, like, the actual travel to Mars, you know, these actual characters and stuff, that's not what matters, right? So one, as I say, one, one thing that is accomplished by including the frame at the end is Lewis very openly inviting us to be on our guard, right? Be on the lookout for Weston. That's not his real name, right? Um, so be on the lookout for Weston, by which, of course, it's, it's good for us to be on the lookout for the Westons of the world wherever we find them, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, that's one effect, right? But there's another effect also, right? Let's look at the last slide. It was Dr. Ransom who first saw that our only chance was to publish in the form of fiction what would certainly not be listened to as fact. He even thought, greatly overrating my literary powers, that this might have the incidental advantage of reaching a wider public, and that certainly it would reach a great many people sooner than Weston. To my objection, that if accepted as fiction, it would for that very reason be regarded as false, he replied that there would be indications enough in the narrative for the few readers, the very few, who at present were prepared to go farther into the matter. And they, he said, will easily find out you or me, and will easily identify Weston. Anyway, he continued, what we need for the moment is not so much a body of belief as a body of people familiarized with certain ideas. If we could even effect in 1% of our readers a changeover from the conception of space to the conception of heaven, we should have made a beginning. That neither of us foresaw, what neither of us foresaw, was the rapid march of events which was to render the book out of date before it was published. These events have already made it rather a prologue to our story than the story itself. But we must let it go as it stands. For the later stages of the adventure, well, it was Aristotle long before Kipling who taught us the formula. That is another story. This is, of course, the second thing that it does. And this, I think, is rather cleverly done. Um, the story as it's told from the very beginning with Ransom on his walking tour, right, describing Ransom walking down the road on his walking tour to the final scene where he walks uh, straight from the spaceship where he's almost died of suffocation and starvation and thirst straight into a pub and orders a pint of bitter, which I really, I really love that ending. A pint of bitter, please, uh, is a great last line. Um, is exactly, Jennifer, the sequel hook, right, or rather the insistence at the end that this is only one of a of a greater story right this is not that 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 story as told from the from the road to the pub right by way of mars uh is a very self-contained story um and he is making it um he's wanting to introduce the concept that this is only part of a larger adventure. This is setting up more stories that he wants to tell. Um, so yes, yes, that's um, um, that is uh, definitely another function. It changes. It recontextualizes the entire story. Um, again, not. And this is where Nancy, for me, the 
like faux the pulling back the curtain, which is obviously not a real pulling back of the curtain, right? Not really Lewis speaking to us in his own person, but rather Lewis speaking to us in an a, a, an only more thinly veiled persona, right? Um, but still a persona, still clearly a fictional persona. Um, the reason that that works for me is that what it does is it it recontextualizes the story, right? So the story is not just the adventures of Ransom. The story is the larger story of which the adventures of Ransom is, was just one episode after all, right? Uh, and in order to understand that story, we have to place that story within its larger, like, contemporaneous context. And that, to me, seems fine. And in fact, I find this, as sequel hooks go, that last paragraph is pretty good, Right? Uh, not only s telling us that there's more, that the adventures are very likely to continue, um, uh, but uh, what neither of us foresaw was the rapid march of events, which was to render the book out of date before it was published. These events have already made it rather a prologue to our story than the story itself. I mean, that's really good, right? Uh, the kind of the implicit relationship that he said. And if you like this, boy, oh my goodness, right? the next books, holy cow. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, but um, anyway, what was the other thing I was going to say? Building on the current events thing. That was another point I wanted to... Oh, um, yeah. The applicability stuff. Because there's more than one level of applicability, Right. First, there's the like more immediate kind of political and ideological applicability, right? Be on the lookout for people who talk like Weston and listen to what they actually mean, right? Because, of course, it's not just about genocide of the species of other planets. It could also be the genocide of, oh, I don't know, Jews and Slavs, right? Um, but not only that, right? Um, even when, you know, this tendency to couch in abstract and metaphorical, you know, ideological, grandiose statements, um, things which are actually cruelties and, um, you know, the abrogation of people's rights and things like that, um, that is common in lots of places and in lots of ways, right? But also, think more broadly of one of the major themes of this book, right, which was confronting the assumptions, like, by going to another planet, um, ran, it is made clear to Ransom all of the assumptions, the unquestioned assumptions that he makes, right, about how the universe works. Um, and all of these assumptions, which he eventually confronts and sees through, through his contact with Malachandra and with the Malachandrians. Um, and those things. So, like, for instance, the, the business about... Uh, the changeover of the concept of space to the concept of heaven is an example that he gives, right? We should have made a beginning. Um, there's, I was just, I, I told you I've been reading the collection, the unabridged collection of Lewis's essays lately. And just yesterday I got to, uh, I was reading his essays on science fiction and uh, those are really interesting. And in particular, I was listening to this transcript and listening to the audiobook version is especially weird because it's an audiobook recording of a transcript of a conversation. Um, so the the audio recreation of a print version of an audio conversation, of an, you know, a, an oral conversation. Anyway, um, I was listening to that, a conversation that he's having with two other authors. And they're talking about science fiction. Um, and it's quite near the end of Lewis's life. It was like 1962, like the year before his death, I think, is when it was when this conversation was... Uh, was 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 recorded. And um, so he refers back to Out of the Silent Planet a couple times uh, in that conversation. And so this is Lewis reflecting on Out of the Silent Planet 25 years after it was published. And when he does that, one of the things that he points to, he, he does suggest not like arrogantly, not cog not even confident that it definitely happened, but when he's, you know, he says when he thinks back and he, he wonders if it's possible that his book might have had 
an impact, you know, when he's sort of looking at the progression of science fiction and he points out that one of the things that is a, a queer trend in more contemporary, you know, the science fiction of the 50s and 60s instead of, of the 20s and the 30s um, was that that assumption that obviously aliens are going to be, you know, um, superhuman in intelligence and subhuman in cruelty, like the War of the Worlds, right? Um, that that assumption was had become less and less general. And so he, he expressed sort of the thought, maybe the, the hope, that perhaps he made some small contribution to that trend, you know, to, to the correction of that trend, that, you know, maybe... So that there is a sense, and again, there's more than just like the politics stuff and the Western stuff, um, that there are some of these assumptions that we make and conceptions that we have that we never, um, uh, you know, we never even second guess or even acknowledge, um, which maybe it would be fruitful for us to to, to rethink. Um, and I, that was just an example of when he's thinking, maybe some people kind of did. Maybe it actually helped a little bit. Um uh yeah yeah um yeah good um okay excellent all right thank you for joining us in our discussion that concludes our discussion of lewis is out of the silent planet um we're going to begin uh in march we're going to begin and, I, and i've got a lot of travel coming up unfortunately um i'm going to be away for uh, I, cause I not, I not only have moot travel, which generally just takes me away over the weekends and thus leaves my Wednesday nights for Mythgard Academy undisturbed. Um, but I've got a week long family trip, uh, in uh, coming up here soon in February. And then I've got another week long trip, uh, for a big conference I'm going to, where I'm giving a, my big talk, uh, about the future of the humanities and talking about Signum's, uh, new programs and stuff, um, at South by Southwest EDU down in Austin. And that's in the beginning of March. So, um, I think we're going to have to start after that. So we'll, the, our next book of course is, uh, Morgoth's ring volume 10 of the history of middle earth. Um, and, uh, we're looking at, um, uh, we're looking at, so I'm looking at starting that probably the middle of March. So it's going to be a little bit of a gap here as I'm traveling, but we'll, we'll be back soon. And I look forward to more discussion of Morgoth's ring. Thank you guys. This was really fun. This was our first CS Lewis discussion, uh, in, uh, the Mythgard Academy. And I am delighted. I've been looking forward to talking about CS Lewis for a long time. Uh, and thank you, Jennifer, uh, for, uh, sponsoring this. That was wonderful. And I've, uh, uh I've really enjoyed that. Um, so thanks everybody. And I will see you guys soon. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.